uh, a challenging task in terms of time management. So uh, without much ado, we have a remarkable panel of uh, people here. So maybe request each of you to take two minutes to make your comments, observations, and we can go around quickly, and that will leave us hopefully a little time for some open discussions as well. Uh, we have a list of panelists on this uh, session. Um, so if I could request uh, Bitu Segal to kick it off, and uh, let me quickly give out the list so you can prepare your thoughts as well. Uh, Bitu and then Debbie Goenka, Geetam Tiwari. Thank you. Um, two minutes. <laughs> three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes? Three minutes. One minute. We have an earth in which you can divide into two. It's the biosphere and the technosphere. My problem right now, Sir Nick, is that I see human ambition expanding the technosphere, but I don't see any science that can do this without eating the biosphere. So if we continue to look for a 10%, 9%, 8% GDP growth, etc. I want someone to come up and suggest that irrespective of all the magic that we promise, that it won't eat into my glaciers, it won't eat into my corals, it won't eat into my wetlands, it won't eat into my deserts. Imagine <laughs> deserts. We don't want them green, we want them as deserts. So I don't see how this magic is going to take place. I believe that evolution has suggested to us and climate change is the hammer with which it's telling us this. The purpose of life is not growth. The purpose of life, life is equilibrium. The longest lived species have lived on a platform. The moment they peak, you found deaths taking place. Now that's one part of the picture. There are so many solutions that are being offered. I'd like us to take a humility pill if we will. There, are, there, are, there is something, there's a term now called biomimicry. It's, it's the latest buzzword. I'd like the economists first to take this on. Nature has its own economy. And nature has its problems and nature has solved its problems. When you get cut on your hand, you can put an antibiotic because it makes you feel good, but at the end of the day, that cell and that cell are joining together and they're making it okay and that's what climate change solution is tomorrow. The ecosystems that we so undervalue um, which we dispense with. Mrs. Dixit, you want, say, a dam, so you drown a valley, not you. You, you want a mine, so you take away Niamgiri. If you continue on this basis, you are basically saying that Niamgiri's only value is the bauxite on its plateau. Now that, I think, is a gross error. It's just as much an error as to say, I've got two kidneys, so why don't I sell one? Okay, you might sell one if you want to save your father, perhaps, but do you want to sell one because you want to have an extra single malt? I think that's the mistake that we're making. And I believe that we are embarked on the ultimate, ultimate adventure. It's called intergenerational colonization. When we requested the British to leave India, it was geographic colonization and perhaps chronological. This chronological colonization right now, I take money from the World Bank and I tell my kids, you pay it back. I think. That's the lightest part of it. The heaviest part of it will be the air that they cannot breathe, the water they cannot drink, the soils that won't produce food, the temperatures which your utterly brilliant presentation taught us so simply, which they won't be able to live with their entire lives. They'll be spending just wondering, how are we going to stay alive? I've got so many more, two minutes, not possible, but minute. nature is the ultimate public distribution system. I'd like the social activists who sit in this room to understand that. There's a legislation called the Forest Rights Act that has just been passed but not yet been cleared. It offers to privatize forests by giving them away to maybe up to a million, two million, ten million, twenty million. We haven't even done the census. At the end of that, what's going to happen is, there's an there's a, there's a Indian phrase, na rahe baas, na baje baasuri. These forests are the mechanisms by which climate change is to be arrested. The people who these forests have been given away to are, have always had community rights, which they should have. But individual rights, we're going to have a bloodbath. The mechanism, like, it's like giving away the lifeboat when the Titanic is about to hit the iceberg. It's not the fault of those people being gifted that ecosystem, the forests. So Nick has told us what these forests mean to us. They're 18 to 20% of our solution. 
It's like going into an ICU and pulling out the tubes and saying, look, that person there hasn't had a cup of coffee since yesterday. Give it to him, you know. The patient's going to die. So I don't think any longer we have the luxury, first of all, of fighting. Personally, speaking for myself, I run a magazine called Sanctuary. I've more or less given up on people in this room. I, I now work with 12-year-olds. First of all, they don't curse me so much. Second of all, I find that there's a naive belief they have that if they do the right thing, it'll actually work. Bitu uncle, bitu uncle, I met the prime minister, I actually gave him this. Now don't worry, the tiger will be saved. Now that kind of thing, I think the cynicism in this room is what's likely to drown us. But I think that like your wound that heals, I think all of us, Sanek, we, we have to trust that nature knows how to actually moderate its climate. It's been trying to do that. All we're doing is overwhelming it. Thank you. Hi, Bitu. I thought we were colonizing the UK just now, but I may be wrong. Uh, I have a three-second message, actually, you know, if climate change is going to affect Mumbai, which it already has begun. The three-second message for all Mumbaikas is head for the hills. Because the way things are going, uh, Mumbai, which started off as seven islands uh, 300 years ago, is probably going to go back to seven islands 30, 40 years down the line. And when people talk about spending $50 billion in Mumbai over the next 10 years, I really wonder whose money they're talking about and $50 billion of investment for what? When we talk about building underground metros at $80 million per kilometer in Mumbai city, I wonder who's going to pay for it. And I wonder whether these uh, metros are going to have submarine capabilities because probably we'll need to have that kind of system in place 20 years down the line. I have one also very important point to make. If you want to solve the problems of cities, you have to talk about solving the problems in the rural hinterland. If you offer free housing to people who encroach inside your cities, then you can't complain about slums and the fact that you can't tackle slum problems. The moment you offer somebody to come and encroach into your city, a very heavy incentive for the encroachment, you can't say, look, this is a problem I can't solve, because there is no end to that problem. The government of India has huge investments planned for rural areas. The delivery mechanisms just don't work. There's corruption at every level, and maybe 5% of the money intended for rural development actually reaches a, a, this thing, intended beneficiary. So those are issues that we actually need to look at very, very seriously, because all these problems are interlinked. And as far as the Forest Rights Act is concerned, I just want to add two things to what Bittu has said. There are win-win solutions possible. We have solutions which will benefit the tribals and save the forests and tackle climate change. It's based on a very simple logic of per capita emissions quota. And my request to Nick is next time he makes a presentation, I think he should proudly say that India has one ton and not leave it as the last kind of thing. But I think India's one ton is something that America and everybody else has to try and achieve. And in the interregnum, because somebody else is using up our carbon quotas, I think we are entitled to ask those people to compensate us for that. And ideally, I would like to see a rich family in the West paying 10,000 rupees a month to a poor tribal family in India for just protecting the forest, because that is what one hectare of forest is worth today, with today's carbon prices. 10,000 rupees a month, ma'am, is what a poor tribal in India will get if you have a carbon trade mechanism which works from family to family. And these are really win-win solutions that occur to all of us. I also want to talk about uh, coastal regulation zone, mangroves, and so on. This is something that actually Mrs. Indira Gandhi started off in 1981. She wanted the coastline of India protected. And that was actually a very far-looking vision. Because when she talked about protecting 500 meters of India's coastline from development, when we got the CRZ notification, when we were helping draft it in 1988, we talked about not allowing development activities within 500 meters of the high tide line. 
and one of the reasons for that was climate change concerns. It's there in the notification. For 20 years, the government of India has done nothing to enforce the notification. It is, in fact, trying to dilute it and scrap it. And my appeal to everybody would be that these are issues that we need to fight for. We can't talk about destroying mangroves around Mumbai to put up sewage and other infrastructure projects. We have to talk about actually strengthening our natural defenses and our physical defenses. I think these are all priorities for our city. I don't think I really, I mean, I can go on and on, but I think as long as we have a situation where people who should be protecting our green spaces and our open areas are actually responsible for destroying them, if the Chief Minister of our state as Minister for Urban Development is clearing project after project which is destroying the greenery in the city and allowing builders to put up huge kind of things without any matching infrastructure, then I think we have a major problem ahead. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, David. Gita. Well, uh, I'd like to relate uh, of a lot of issues that we have discussed yesterday. And now today we have started talking about climate change in the context of urban age. Let's put it that way. And uh, taking on from that, in fact, a list of issues that uh, Mrs. Dixit uh, shared with us, and she is, in fact, my chief minister, and we are all very proud of it. And I think she is considered one of the most forward-looking leaders and uh, forward-looking chief ministers in our country. But this is where the challenge of climate change and challenge of urbanization comes. Because the list of green policies that we have adopted in Delhi, in fact, the complexity is that they are not green ultimately. They, they don't remain green ultimately. For example, First is that Delhi has been awarded Green City Award because it has 100% fleet on compressed natural gas. In 2001, when the Supreme Court mandated that we should have complete fleet on uh, compressed natural gas, there was, you know, there was a lot of disruption initially because uh, the system was not ready for it. So people using public transport were in fact penalized. The ultimate effect, and we've been monitoring it since 2001, has been that up to 2003, the number of buses in Delhi, in fact, have reduced. If you reduce your fleet, your ultimate number of users in public transport goes down. And because we have very high ownership of two-wheelers, those people start using two-wheelers. So ultimately, your CO2 emissions increase, despite having CNG fleet in Delhi. Second, in fact, I think you know that now we are facing the challenge in Delhi, it is green versus red. The number one problem in Delhi system, and it is not alone to Delhi, I think this is becoming universal in all cities in India and also the cities that we visited in other countries. It is the major public health concern. Number of people, our most productive age group, dying in traffic accidents. And all scientific understanding shows that it is, in fact, our policies which are resulting into this. The way we are designing our roads, the, way, the kind of systems, the investments we are doing, great separated junctions, wider roads, expressways inside the cities, this is huge, huge investment which is going, any uh, transport, uh, urban development project, actually your largest budget is in transport. And this transport is actually creating not just the climate change. I mean, that is another issue at all, uh, altogether. You invest more in expressways, you invest more in widening roads, and you have more cars. If you have more cars, it's the correlation is very simple. You have more CO2 emissions. But on the other hand, what we see, because in our cities we are talking about captive users of bicyclists and pedestrians and public transport. Every public transport trip, every person who uses a bus or metro is a pedestrian first. If we have not thought about how will people walk along the road, how will we people cross the road, today we are killing 2,000 people in Delhi, and I know how concerned you have been about this 
in last six months and various strategies have been tried out. One very simple thing which we have to do is every single project that is on the board today, and we have thousands of crores of investment planned to meet Commonwealth Games target. Every project has to be audited right now. How is it going to impact our pedestrians who are also our public transport users? Because more people you have on ped as pedestrians, public transport, and bicyclists, these are your green modes. This is what is actually going to meet your climate change targets. So without that, we cannot solve this problem. So first, just in 30 seconds, I would like to say, in short term, I think, my appeal would be that Delhi has shown a leadership. This is yet another opportunity. We can show leadership to the whole world. We have an opportunity. We must get all projects on the board audited for how they affect pedestrians, bicyclists, and public transport users. We have time to modify them. We can do it. And we have done it in past. I think that is one major thing that I would like to uh, appeal to you that we should go ahead and do it. Thank you. Thank you, Geetam. I'd like to thank Bitu, Debbie, and Geetam. And before I hand off to Tony, I just want to make one quick observation. It's um, actually heartening to hear from the three of you a sense of pragmatism as well, because as a social activist, one of the things that I feel that India lacks is a crisis of collaboration. I think we are in civil society too fragmented and tend to occupy the moral high ground without recognizing that ultimately answers come out of negotiations. Negotiations between ourselves and then negotiations between us and the political system. So I think it's good to hear you coming up with practical ideas and be to have a little more hope for those of us in this generation and not just the preteens. Thank you. Um, now we've got um, minus 20 minutes uh, to, in which to take questions from the audience and to have uh, final responses from uh, our key uh, contributors to this session. What I'm going to do, I've been handed a number of questions which I'm going an, to attempt to summarize while giving credit to those who asked them. And then if I can perhaps ask you, Nicholas and Sheila Dixit, if you can then join in at the end with your final thoughts, embracing some of the answers to some of these questions. So. <clears throat> Ari Rangier, of the, who, the Office of the Municipal Commissioner in Mumbai, has asked a question which has to do with the extent to which climate change being an issue which is clearly economic as well as an ethical one. The point that Nicholas Stern's report was clearly uh, that the approach that Nicholas Stern adopted. And the question asks, or says, instead of trading carbon uh, credits on a project-to-project -project basis under the Kyoto Protocol, why not do it on the basis of per capita greenhouse gas emissions? In short, why not allow countries that are currently low consumers per capita um, to receive a flow of resources from those countries which are high users in order to help them get the resources to invest in uh, low carbon technology. And there's a question from Jamshid Kanja. I hope I got that name right, couldn't quite read the writing. Also, a similar one from Ben Piven, who is at the Tata Institute. And this question is, given the extent that rich countries have used the environment to two, for two centuries, how will it be possible for developing countries to catch up without, to some extent, doing the same? And then a question from a slightly different position from Bruce Raymer, who is a trustee of the uh, Herrhausen Foundation. Um, what was the cause of global warming in past times, i.e., what ended the ice age melting the glaciers and is this a natural cycle? So addressed probably to you, Nicholas, but also perhaps to the minister. And that is the extent to which, I suppose, this time is different to earlier times. I think that's the question. So perhaps I can now ask our two original contributors if they could sum up, not only on the basis of the three contributions we heard, but also perhaps 
pick up uh, in their responses the replies to these questions from the floor. Nicholas. Thank you. Is this, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the I'll use first, the title if you carry on like this. <laughs> first, um, I'd like to express my own uh, admiration of uh, um, Mrs. Dixit's leadership in, in Delhi. Um, I, I've been coming to Delhi now for uh, 33 years, and uh, the change is, is really remarkable. Um, and it takes uh, strength and leadership to get there. So I salute that, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dixit. Um, on uh, the story uh, that Bitu raised of uh, finding an equilibrium um, with the world, that has to be right. Um, and we have to do it uh, at a speed which we're not used to acting. Um, there is a story which uh, uh, my friend John Schellenhuber tells of two planets uh, meeting in space and one planet says to the other, you don't look very well. And the planet uh, replies, yeah, it's, uh, it's the human race. And uh, the first planet replies, don't worry, it doesn't last very long. <laughs> um, And uh, we have to react. We have to react in real in real time here. In other words, the kinds of evolutionary changes we've been used to to modify our behaviour in the past just happen too slowly in relation to the kind of speed of change we have now. And that's why we have to use uh, analysis and rationality to think it through and act fast in real time. My own view is that uh, the two greatest problems in the world are global poverty and uh, climate change. And they're very tightly linked. And we have to look at them both together. And uh, I do think that low carbon growth is possible. Uh, we can do uh, zero carbon uh, electricity. If we have zero carbon electricity, we can have zero carbon transport. We can stop deforestation. We can start uh, reforestation. We can be much more energy efficient than we are now particularly if we organize uh, our lives in cities in different kinds of ways. And all these things are consistent with rising living standards. So I think we have to find a way to marry the growth story and the responsibility towards the environment stories. And I think we can do that. I say that because I think it's possible. I also say that just in terms of the real politique. If it becomes a horse race between growth and development on the one hand, and environment on the other, environment will lose. So we have to find a way. And uh, I do think it's not uh, pie in the sky. I do think it's possible and practical. And that is the, uh, that is the challenge. I certainly share uh, the ethical issues uh, raised by uh, Debbie Goenka. And uh, I'll come, back, come to that in response to the question on trading. And I do think that um, moving around in cities by walking and cycling uh, must be a big part of the story. And um, one thing that, I mean, economists are, are not bad at everything. Uh, and uh, one thing I think they understand a little bit about is how to use infrastructure. The answer to people's increasing demand for mobility is to use the infrastructure we've got much better than we do. It is not uh, tarmac. It is uh, using roads wisely. Pricing for roads is uh, one way of doing that. Designing them so that they are uh, advantaging cyclists and buses is another way of doing that. So I think we must not see the answer to traffic in terms of uh, flyovers and another uh, couple of lanes on the highway. It's managing. Uh, people's desire to move around, not stopping them moving around, helping them move around in a much easier and environmentally friendly way. And public transport and cycles and walking will be a, a big part uh, of that. Um, so, uh, and it will be safer too, I think, uh, Geetam, if we, if, we, uh, if we do it that way. I tried to build in, now just turning very quickly to the questions, I tried to build the trading story into uh, the analysis that I was offering, 
Um, I do think that the rich countries, um, if they adopt very tough targets, and I gave the kind of targets I believe they should adopt, at least 75% reductions by uh, 2050. And if we have trading in that context, it will give us the kind of price of carbon that can drive uh, real investment in zero carbon technologies, particularly in poor countries. So I think it's actually an efficient and an equitable way of doing it. You can organize the targets in different kinds of ways. I do understand uh, the appeal, the ethical appeal of given carbon budgets for everybody. I think actually in terms of the practical politics to point to the kinds of 75, 80% targets that rich countries should take on is at the moment the most effective way of doing it because that's the language that California and France and other countries are talking. It's not far away from the uh, same kind of effect. But there you get the trading gives you with the strong targets of the rich countries both the efficiency and the equity that uh, we, should be, uh, we should be looking for. Will developing countries follow a different route from the rich countries? In other words, uh, will they follow um, high hydrocarbon uh, growth? I hope they don't. I hope they follow growth, but I just hope they don't follow high hydro hydrocarbon growth. And they don't have to. I think looking back, that period may, see, may seem to be rather, rather peculiar. And uh, what we have to do is just change our ways. I think it was Sheikh Yamani who said the Stone Age didn't change because of a shortage of stones. <laughs> and uh, I don't think we're going to stop using hydrocarbons because of shortage of hydrocarbons. We have to stop using hydrocarbons just because it's far too damaging to use them. And I think we can find and will find ways of growing strongly uh, with uh, without that. Um, the causes of global change, of uh, climate change in the past, there are oscillations in the sun's solar energy which do cause movements over time in the uh, temperature of uh, the world. Also there are changing particulates in the atmosphere. Uh, big volcanic explosions create dirt in the atmosphere which stops the heat getting in. Those are the two primary sources of, as it were, natural oscillations. And natural oscillations have occurred and do occur. What we're seeing now, though, and if you look carefully, and I'm not a physicist, but if you look carefully at the physics of all this, and you try to explain what we're now seeing by those natural explanations, you can look at the solar oscillations of the sun, you can measure the particulates in the atmosphere, and you cannot explain what we're now seeing from those things. And the scientists have made that absolutely crystal clear. This is 19th century physics, the physics of, um, of uh, a greenhouse gases trapping the heat. It's not some newfangled science. It's been made more precise over these last few years, and you really can't explain what we're now seeing from the natural oscillations. And we are moving into temperature, the possibility of temperature uh, increases outside the realms of human experience. The dinosaurs saw five degrees but human beings have never seen it and we don't know how they could, uh, they could uh, cope with it. So um, those I think are the very quick pass, uh, probably not quick enough, at the questions which, uh, which were raised. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Minister, would you like to comment on what's been said since you spoke and pick up any of the other points? No, I don't think I'd like to comment. I've learned a lot. So we, when we meet in the afternoon, we'll discuss this further because it'll require long answers. Okay? Well, okay thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'll just finally hand over to my colleague, Ramesh, who is going to wind up this session. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you to both Nick Stern as well as Mrs. Sheila Dixit for uh, two remarkable presentations to kick off this discussion, as well as to Bitu, Debi, and Geetham for your uh, interventions. Thanks to Tony and uh, LSE and uh, the Urban Age program to put this together. It's been, as Mrs. Dixit, I think, said, very enlightening and